So uh, Mike and Caitlin, thank you so much for, for joining us. Mike, you are a co-founder of Instagram. Caitlin, you are an early employee at TaskRabbit. So it totally makes sense to me that when, um, when I think of you guys, exactly what I think of is bail reform, for sure. <laughs> um, probably spent a lot of time inside, I understand. It's, uh... so, so tell me, I mean, what, this, is a, this is the issue that you guys have decided to, to spend your time and your money and your passion on, on ju justice reform, on bail reform, on looking at the justice system. This doesn't necessarily seem like a super intuitive cause that I would, I would assume you guys would embrace. So tell me how you got to that. Yeah, I think we kind of have to rewind a couple years to when we first started thinking about giving. We realized our giving was pretty ad hoc. People would come and say, hey, I've got this interesting cause, I'm raising money, and we were making yes or no decisions individually. Um, if you talk to any venture investor, they'll say that's the worst way you could possibly do investment in their world, right? You want to have some worldview, you need to have some concepts, you need to have uh, patterns that you're thinking about. So we took a step back, this was about three years ago, I'd say, and said, all right, let's pause here, let's try to develop some, a little bit more of a strategy. And the first thing we thought was, well, clearly if we, you know, like figure out our, like, important causes that matter to us, it's going to naturally flow out what we're going to start giving to. So we hired a, a consultant giving coach, which is kind of a funny job. I told somebody last night about this. They're like, there must be like five of them in the world. But I think there's more of them out there. It's a gro <laughs> growing industry. And what she did is she sat down with us and did a bunch of exercises. So um, picking out headlines from um, the Times and saying, which of these do you most react to? Like what really like either inspires you or grinds your gears and makes you uh, really angry and inspired to action? Um, what words inspire you the most, phrases? Um, just did a bunch of these sort of value exercises. And what was interesting was it didn't emerge that there were areas or causes that really stood out. It wasn't, you know, I'm Brazilian. It wasn't, you know, investing back in Brazil necessarily, or um, we both have Jewish backgrounds. It wasn't really that either. But it came down to some values. Um, and I don't remember all of them exactly, but there were things like fairness and equality and access to opportunity. And those are things that sort of cut across um, a bunch of dis different disciplines. And then in parallel to that, um, we connected with a couple of friends of ours, uh, Carrie and Dustin, who are doing it up in philanthropy. I think you, you get your best talk about that. But we started thinking about their approach to giving, too. Sure. Um, we had conversations with philanthropists when we were starting out, and they gave us the advice to do this work with both our head and our heart. So what Mike was describing was some of the work that um, tapped into our heart, what were the things that resonated with us. But we also felt like if we were just to do that, we would be missing the exterior analysis of the world and where the opportunities are for a philanthropist to have an outsized impact. Um, and so we teamed up with the Open Philanthropy Project, which is um, um, also um, started by tech founders. Um, and we, we worked with them to kind of understand three things about each cause we were considering. The first was how important is the cause, and that was in some ways a market sizing exercise. How many people are affected by that, and how deeply are they affected? Um, the second pillar that we looked at every cause um, uh, to consider w was um, tractability. Is there a unique window of opportunity right now that um, would allow a philanthropist to help turn the gears of change in this area? Um, is there a problem that can really be solved? And then the last one is neglectedness. So Mike and I are pretty excitable people. Um, we, you know, we can get into education, we can get into environmental causes, um, but there's also a lot of other people who are interested in those causes too. And um, we felt like we could really have the biggest impact in areas that were neglected, and criminal justice reform is one of those areas. So when we kind of, when we, when we looked at what were our values, which are fairness, equality of opportunity, um, helping people lead fulfilling lives, and then we looked at where we thought there was, you know, an important, tractable, and neglected cause, that intersection, the Venn diagram there, was criminal justice reform for us. And it's interesting because you guys have thought and written a lot about effective altruism, right? About sort of the trying to use philanthropy dollars to use the altruistic instinct to do things that are most effective, exactly mm -hmm. as you were li lining out. And many people within the effective altruism movement, they'll talk very distinctly about metrics and measurable outcomes, ROI, but what's interesting is, is 
they don't, they, that conversation oftentimes fails to capture the emotional aspect mm -hmm. of giving, right? They, because it's hard to measure. I mean, how do you think about, when you came to criminal justice reform, and it seemed to align with your values, and it seemed like you could have an impact, how did you decide that that was the place that you wanted to play? And since then, have you found the emotional reward that you were expecting from that, given the other things that you could have focused on? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's important to have that connection, or else, at least I'll speak for us, it wouldn't be a sustainable thing that we could see ourselves doing for 10, 20 years. And I don't, you know, criminal justice is one pillar that we're focused on. I imagine um, there'll, there'll be others. We're also looking at income equality. Um, but pretty soon after getting sort of exposed to the sort of on paper, um, kind of fit for criminal justice, we dove in and that's prison visits, talking to people who were formerly incarcerated, meeting the organizations, and ultimately like, um, and even like, you know, when you first, when you're in that mindset, it's everywhere. So we'd be driving and like, it felt like every NPR story was about mm -hmm. some injustice in the, in the criminal justice system. Um, and Caitlin can, can tell you. I like, actually think you're right. Every NPR so, story is, is about, about, which is yeah. great. Actually, it's going to be covered. <laughs> um, and I mean, there was one particular, was, we were driving, I like, really distinctly remember it because we were also driving by all the bail bonds uh, places down in Soma. And it was a story about how um, folks were getting pulled over for traffic tickets, couldn't pay the traffic ticket and like how that one moment became the spiral out of which they lost their jobs, like often were separated from their families. Um, and like it's that feeling of like real injustice and like anger for me. So um, I think the emotion part followed pretty quickly. And I think, Caitlin, I think you, as you've gotten deeper and deeper, it's become like a deeply personal thing for you as mm -hmm, well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think one of the challenges is that change doesn't happen super quickly. And this is, I think, a lesson that I've had to learn having been in the tech world and then entering the nonprofit world, um, is that, especially if you're dealing with policy change, like a lot of criminal justice reform will happen at a state and local policy change level, that can take years. And so we haven't been working in this field for very long, so the kinds of emotional rewards that you're talking about haven't necessarily happened for us. But the fury that I feel <laughs> when I hear about how messed up our system is, is there, and that's the fire that's keeping me going. Well, and that's a really interesting point, because I think when we were talking about Hadi before, he was talking about how they, they engage their employees by giving them this gift, this reward of seeing code change lives, right? Mm -hmm. Teaching kids. And oftentimes, there's the, motiva the positive motivation and then the negative motivation, which is that you're just so pissed off about what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. when, you think, when you think about your commitment to this particular issue, and, I, and I, I'm going to dig a little bit deeper in how you guys think about how you give to it. Mm -hmm. When you think about your commitment to this and you say to yourself, this is a commitment we want to make for 10, 15, 20 years, mm -hmm. how does the reward that you get from it need to change mm -hmm. so that 15 years from now, you're as passionate as you are t today, because if you're pissed off for 15 years, that's just a rough life, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Although the next four years, I think everyone's going to be able to accomplish in this room, but, but 15, <laughs> it's a long time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's a great question, and um, I mean, the sort of the answer that I that I hope will come to fruition is that we will see incremental gains. I mean, right now there's about 2.3 million people behind bars every night in the United States. I think that it's reasonable to see that number start to go down over the next 10 years. Um, I think forecasts that I've seen think that it's like maybe a 10 or a 15 percent decrease in that time period. Um, but you know, 90% of 2.3 million people is still mass incarceration. And uh, <laughs> I don't know that, so the fury will still be there even though I'm, you know, we're getting payoffs of, of that incremental reduction. The other thing I think of is part of this process in the same way that, again, like trying to draw some parallels I think are legitimate, at least in our experience. Um, and if you talk to venture capitalists, they'll often talk about investing in teams versus necessarily the exact idea, and that's been the case so far, um, oh, where some of the people who have most inspired us, um, like Danielle Sarad over at Common Justice, it's like, I love what she's doing at Common Justice, but I also think she's an incredible person who is going to keep doing interesting things. So when I think about the long run, it's also about seeing them develop some of the people that we've backed, mm -hmm. um, develop their ideas, build their organizations, have their ideas enter the national conversation around reform. And I think that's the other way you find kind of a longevity in there is developing those partnerships and relationships mm -hmm, over time. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, and just to add to that, I would say, um, something that would make me feel really satisfied at that time frame would be to see some of these um, fantastic entrepreneurs who we're working with, um, 
Gina Clayton started this incredible organization <laughs> <laughs> um, called SE Justice, which is doing organizing for women with incarcerated loved ones. And they are a great example of um, a team that is scrappy and small and lean and has a path to scalability very quickly. What I would love to see is for you know, some of those ideas that have incubated to actually have blossomed and reached scale, and also for government funding to have stepped in and start providing um, resources for these. Yeah. I mean, there's, what is it? It's $400 billion of philanthropic giving in the United States. Um, I don't know actually what our GDP is or what the government budget is, but it's in the trillions of dollars. So, so it's a very small percentage. So as philanthropists, I think it's in some ways our duty to be the risk capital for, for kind of social change and then allow and encourage the government to step in we should not be funding SE Justice in 10 years. I mean, because the government should be funding right. them. Yeah. Wait, and I, I think people are enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, At least one person. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone else is like, jails. Uh, let, let's talk about how you make your decisions, because I know that one of the things that um, a number of people here ha have, are thinking about, and that people who come to Fast Forward who want to be donors say is they say, I don't know where to start, I don't know how to choose my topic, I don't know how much to give, I don't know if I should give to one thing or to multiple things. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you guys sit down, what's the process for you to decide how, how much philanthropy you want to engage in a certain year? Do you, do you choose a number at the beginning of each year? Is it opportunistic? What is that process like? And then how do you decide whether it's going to go to multiple causes or to one cause, I imagine, you know, you can be halfway through a year and suddenly the Syrian refugee crisis emerges, which is equally infuriating. Mm -hmm. How do you think about those questions? Yeah, I mean, the, the first thing we did was we picked a number and we said, I don't even know, it was like five or 10 years, we we're like, this is the number that we think will be operating. And the interesting thing that changed very quickly is year one, I remember where us looking and being like, wow, it's gonna be like hard to like find organizations that we connect with and we feel like we can engage individually and reach that number. And by year two, it's like, ah, like it doesn't, like things don't fit in there anymore. And one of the reasons- Meaning is that the number was- The number was too small, exceed. yeah, right. after year two. And one of the things that we learned really quickly was- Can, can I ask a question yeah, really quickly? Yeah. How did you come to, how did you figure out that number? Was it, was that, gut or was your, were you talking to folks? Was there a formula you used? I think it was a fair amount of gut and it was like, does that feel Absolutely. low? Does it feel low? It was like the point where you're uncomfortable was probably the right point to be, um, especially coming <laughs> out, you're like, okay, like that's what we're doing. And you know, we were also getting married. So we're also like planning out the next, you know, hopefully 50, 60, 70 years of our lives. Um, so it was all kind of coming together at the same time. And it was, yeah, actually it was part of that conversation, which is like, all right, like, if we are planning on giving away most of our money while we're still alive, like here's the path to doing that in a way that's sustainable over, yeah. over a long period of time. But one of the things we learned really quickly from talking to other donors and organizations is you don't wanna do the like, here's a big grant, you're one, and like, see you later, we'll never talk to you again. And the thing that organizations most value is that ongoing commitment, both in time and money. Um, so that's how very quickly like your baseline just keeps growing because you have organizations that you like and you've engaged with and you're really either implicitly or explicitly making multi-year commitments too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I would also say we do kind of two different types of giving. So Future Justice Fund is one part of our philanthropy, but then we have what I kind of like to call good citizenship giving. Like we like going to SF MoMA. We want to support SF MoMA. Do we think that, you know, it's the most strategic thing for us to be doing, um, especially within the framework of effective altruism? No, but we still feel an obligation and we get a lot of pleasure out of being involved with that. So we've divided up our giving into our strategic bucket and then our sort of personal good citizenship bucket as well. And now, um, you know, since uh, November, we feel like there's this new bucket that we need to have that we're adding on, um, which is how do we sort of um, grapple with some of the new political realities. Um, and we, we don't have answers yet. We're, we're starting to figure that out. Um, but that is an example of, of you know, having an event um, cause us to increase our budget. And, and, and it's interesting, you, you know, I know that you guys are in, involved with GiveWell um, and Effective Altruism. And one of, one of the things that GiveWell says and, and sort of the Effective Altruism School is that there's a huge emphasis on choose one thing. Mm -hmm. Choose one group and invest in it. Choose one topic and in, invest mm -hmm. in it. And that's hard, right? It's hard to say, I'm, I'm going to sit on the sidelines for the Syria, Syrian crisis. How do you think about that? I mean, as these issues come up, when you look at, at the, the, the election and the events that come out of that, what's the calculus that you do to say, this one rises to a level 
that we, we can diminish what we might spend on criminal justice reform to try and affect this other issue. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that, are you using, are you going on gut? Are you, is there a formula there? How do you think about it? Well, um, so if you were to ask that question of the folks who work at Open Philanthropy Pro uh, Project, they actually do have a formula. They have a sort of, it's a back of the envelope calculation, um, but they, they use a metric. Um, uh, it, it's a, an economic value assigned to a year of human life. This is not like a new thing that they've invented, but it's about $50,000 per year of human life. And they will actually estimate how much an intervention in a cause um, might um, improve or um, save in terms of human life years. So they'll actually get a financial number and they'll be able to say, well, if we, you know, if we invested this money in criminal justice reform versus the Syrian refugee crisis, you know, we have a number that looks like five million versus. And do you use that number? Or do you guys sort of use that formula and say, okay, we don't, we don't have to make decisions. We can just kind of plug it into the calculator. Um, well, it's tough because it's that really number hard. is also so dependent on all kinds of assumptions that you're making about the world. Um, so it's very easy to have arguments about it. But I think the idea is that um, you are at least thinking about those things. And then, you know, you can choose to, um, to go with your gut after that, but you have a piece of information right. um, to, to kind of make some kind of comparison of value. B before we go to questions, let me ask, um, what's the biggest mistake you guys have made as you've become philanthropists, as you've started to, to try and be exert yourself more masterfully? <laughs> what's the biggest misstep? Hmm. I think there was, before we were strategic, I'll speak for myself, you have mistakes too. Um, we, there were a few organizations kind of pre-coming to the criminal justice kind of angle of our philanthropy that we, we'd already heard the advice around the multi-year commitments, but not the advice around the strategic giving and, and cost selection. So like that combination was, so we, there was a few kind of like legacy grants. They weren't huge, so we were still in that startup phase um, where, you know, they're great organizations, but they're a portion of our budget that, you know, we probably now would have chosen to spend um, or give to um, some are more in line with our, our kind of areas of focus. I think that's probably the biggest one. And luckily it was a, 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 on the smaller side, but that was the, knowing the multi-year commitment, I don't want this to be a paralyzing uh, sort of influence on any of the uh, folks who are giving out there because I do think it's important to learn, but maybe learn smaller and then expand was, mm -hmm. was the thing that we that's learned. That's interesting. Yeah, I would echo that. I mean, I think um, out the gate we gave grants that were in size, a very high percentage of our overall sort of bucket for the year. Um, and then when we started realizing that there were many more organizations that we wanted to fund, we kind of had run out of our budget for that. And so um, I probably would have given smaller grants to start with and ramped those up rather than being in a sort of awkward situation that I am right now of having given really big grants to organizations and then explaining to them, hey, we want to support the broader ecosystem by investing in other organizations as well. We are, we're now having to kind of ramp But that down. does take more work. And, and you're, you're, you're working, you, you now, your job now is working with the, your, your, your group, right? Yeah. Because it takes more work to give small grants initially and it go does. through that process. Yeah. And I actually think that that's one of the advantages of being a funder of our size. I mean, we're not a multi-billion dollar foundation. Um, so we, we are able to move really quickly. We don't have a lot of bureaucracy. Um, and uh, we can give smaller grants. Um, there are, you know, there are certain organizations that are so early on that, um, you know, Open Society or Ford Foundation, just it's not worth their time Absolutely. really to make grants to them. So we've tried to find where our comparative advantage is as funders, and we think that, you know, our ability to move quickly and, and give grants sort of in the range of like 25 to 150K to an organization is, is unique. Let's go to questions. Um, S sir, down here, yeah. Or, yeah, the, we'll run a mic over to you. Uh, Jim Fruckerman of Benetech. Uh, finding this conversation about GiveWell and what you guys are doing kind of interesting, because GiveWell pretty much only scores global humanitarian projects as worth investing in, right? Yeah. And, you know, you talk about your new bucket for the last couple of uh, months, you know, civil rights, human rights will never score in the give well, you know, worldview. So, so talk about philanthropy while also being on the side of women's rights or immigrants' rights or some of these other issues that might take 10 years to have fruition or yeah. hopefully, hopefully less than four. Yeah. I, that's a fantastic question. So um, for those of you in the room who don't know what GiveWell are, 
uh, is they are a um, charity recommendation um, service, and they are very, very metrics driven. Um, and what they want to be able to tell people who use their product and service is that if they give X dollars, they know they are going to have, like, they're going to save, you know, 12 children's eyesight, or they're going to save 40 lives for that amount. So um, that's fantastic for people who want to be sure that their money is going to um, have an immediate impact. But um, it leaves a lot on the table. I mean, some of the most fundamental change doesn't happen in those kinds of easily measurable moments. Um, it requires a longer-term investment, longer gestation. Um, and I think there's absolutely room for that kind of stuff in the effective altruism framework. It's just a lot harder to measure and a lot harder to calculate. Um, and so that's kind of, that's actually, if you talk to the people who are at GiveWell, they started um, with um, Carrie Tuna and Dustin Moskovitz, the Open Philanthropy Project, in an effort to explore what would it look like to, you know, to invest in things that are much harder to measure, um, but still use the framework of doing the most good you possibly can in choosing which causes you'll invest in. So I, does that answer your question, kind of? Yeah. Sir, over here. Uh, hi, I'm Ben. I am with Bright Funds and the Salampta Family Project. Um, my question is, with, with the understanding that not every person is able to ha have a consultant to be strategic with their philanthropy, how would you recommend making strategic philanthropy, or using the principles of strategic philanthropy, a habit uh, on a day-to-day -day basis? So a, did you get that? So the question is, how, for an average person, how would you recommend making strategic philanthropy a habit on a day-to-day -day basis? That's interesting. I think that like the, the work that we did around value, like if I think of all of the work that we did, a lot of the like downstream work, working with the consultant was like, you know, getting the right like DAP set up, right? Which is like a detail and like there's good online resources. I think if I'd pick the one fundamental thing, it was really the value um, kind of narrowing down our values and coming, and it was actually really good because we were about to get married that we actually had values and <laughs> that aligned very well. Um, it was a good exercise to do a month before your wedding. Um, <laughs> Particularly if they don't align so well. <laughs> <Yeah. exactly. laughs> um, but I think that one and, and grounding the decisions you make in that thing, it's actually similar when I think about Instagram, like what we choose to work on or not, it's grounded in the mission. I think it's same, it's like our mission and values ground our giving. So I think coming to that and keeping that in mind is probably the clearest way. And like, you don't really need a consultant for that first part, just some discipline and you know a few Sunday copies of the New York Times and a pair of scissors and try to like start getting at what, uh, what starts like resonating. Um, there are a lot of ideas that I have, so I'll just um, share a couple. Um, I think one, one thing that was a trend um, over the last like 10 to 15 years was trying to make sure that you're giving to organizations that have very low overhead. Um, and uh, I, I could not disagree more <laughs> with that. <laughs> um, you know, when you think about people who are at the top of their game in the private sector, you pay them really well. You want to incentivize them to stay with your organization. And so I would say, like, one thing that people can do very easily is kind of, like, throw away. I mean, you want to be responsible. You don't want, you know, organizations that are throwing money around. But also, like, think about, um, you know, don't worry so much maybe about, whether it's like 5% overhead or 10% overhead, or even honestly like 50% overhead. Sometimes that's what it takes to get the talent in the room that's really gonna solve the problem well. So. Well, unfortunately we are out of time, but thank you guys so much. And, and I will say, and I, I'm sure many in the audience, you know, the, the plight of the incarcerated is something that most people actually, it's impossibly hard to get people to care about. So. Thank you guys for the work you're doing. Thank you for coming and joining us, and uh, good luck going forward. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.